Today, Canadians are rallying just like this in 18 cities across the country. It has to be one of the largest pro-science uh, Canada-wide events in Canadian history. Yeah. What do we want? Evidence-based decision making. When do we want it? After peer review. Awesome. Excellent, guys. Unfortunately, today we're witnessing the undermining of some of the foundations of Canadian science through the cuts in programs and departments and, and, un, and sometimes unnecessary political intervention in research and through the direct and indirect muzzling of scientists. Yay! Cuts to essential scientific programs and services have undermined our society's scientists' ability to serve the public good. Research facilities have been downsized and in some cases completely uh, eliminated. Now, communi new communications and media, for example, relations uh, policies have limited the ability of federal scientists to speak directly to media and to the public. These measures have led to a reduction in the number of reporters who even bother to ask uh, scientists to talk to them on, on certain niche files, environment files, transportation files, whatnot. This is not the kind of democracy that I want to live in. Public science must be accessible to the public. And what is our key point? Well, it's simplicity itself. Sound policy needs sound science. The facts do not change just because the Harper government has chosen ignorance over evidence and ideology over honesty. Take environmental protections as an example, which this government has been systematically dismantling. Climate change didn't just take a break because this government watered down all of its carbon emission targets. We are not seeing any evidence that species are magically recovering from the brink of extinction all by themselves because the Minister of the Environment has stopped listening to the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. For shame. Take the tar sands and the inability to detect that serious contamination is building up in surrounding lands and waters. Not to mention in Aboriginal communities. Take the decline of endangered fish species and the refusal to declare their critical habitat, a refusal that has only been overcome because the federal court had to order the federal government to do its job. Over and over and over again, we've seen this disregard for evidence so as to appease industry lobby groups rather than serve Canadians who have elected this government to serve them. It's going to take us a fair bit of time to clean up this mess, but we have another problem. And that's this, that part of this government's issue is that the facts are not their friends. <laughs> to deal with this problem, the government's instituted a kind of Orwellian plan to make it harder for Canadians to find out what the facts actually are. Failing that, failing that, they have shown perfect willingness to make up some new facts that will fit the government agenda. What are some of these points in their plan? First, muzzling government scientists. This is simply ridiculous. We live in a modern democracy and telling scientists that they are not able to communicate readily their professional work to the people who paid them to do it is a pretty striking statement on the condition of Canada's democracy. We call today on the Harper government to unmuzzle Canada's federal research scientists. Another part of the plan 
is to shift research emphasis towards industrial applications. Now, increasing industrial research is not, nothing to be decried. It's not a bad thing. But when it comes at the expense of pure research, it creates problems. Now, if you want to try to make the argument that a healthy research environment is what you get when all you fund is industrial research applications, then I'm afraid the facts will not be your friends. If there is a single striking, painful example for what this situation of defunding pure research has brought, let's take a look at the National Research Council. In 2006, they published nearly 2,000 peer-reviewed publications. Building on this incredible wellspring of ideas, they published 53 patents. In 2012, their publication output had dropped by 80%. Their patent publication rate dropped by 95%, going from 53 to 3. This is what emphasizing industrial research at the expense of pure research brings you. Next, shutting down world-class facilities. Point three of a four-point Orwellian plan. If the facts are not your friends, make sure the places where you collect the facts don't work anymore. There's a sign out here for the Experimental Lakes area. The finest outdoor experimental ecosystem lab in the world. <laughs> Barely saved by the province of Ontario as the federal government madly dashed to shut something down and in in invoke all kinds of costs that were massively greater than the costs of just keeping it open. It's a, an act of insanity, and it is not the only example. Research stations across Canada are in serious trouble with drops of pure research funding to end CERC. We need to reverse this. We need our science facilities working for Canadians. We need them fully staffed. We need them working all year round. <laughs> One last point. The last part of this Orwellian plan shoot the messenger. This government is all about attack. They are going to attack us for asking them to use reason and evidence. They, the Minister of Natural Resources has declared that environmental people or people who provide information about the environment might be terrorists. <laughs> Where to even begin? <laughs> this government has an enemies list. This is an incredible state of affairs. I suspect that some of the people here today are on that list. It's a badge of honor. We need this government to stop attacking the messenger. It's unproductive and it makes us look medieval in Canada. Ms. Public Science, that told us that lead and gasoline was a really, really, really bad idea when the Ethel, Cor Ethel Corporation was telling us that it was safe. And it's Public Science that told us to tobacco was killing people when the tobacco companies were trying to convince us that tobacco was safe. That's the kind of research that governments have to fund because companies are not going to fund it. It's not going to be part of their research and development budget. And we can't stop funding research like that just because it's inconvenient. It, just because it's inconvenient to the resource extraction industries, we can't stop monitoring the changes from climate change. And we're not saying that scientists should speak for government, but scientists should be able to speak for their science. I mean, it's pretty scary when journals like Nature write editorials saying that, you know, Canada's got muzzling our scientists, or when the Royal Society of Canada tells us that there's a problem. And I have great hope that we can turn this 18-wheeler around. I think we can, we can make change here. I think the government is vulnerable in this. And, you know, in the United States, fewer than 10 years ago, they were enacting the same kinds of policies. They were taking knives to public science, and they realized the mistake. And we can learn from their mistakes instead of making these mistakes all over again. So get everyone you know to go to evidencefordemocracy.ca, sign the petition, 
email their MPs. Because a strong economy relies on strong publicly funded research. And our healthiest future relies on healthy funding for public science. Thank you. In recent years, we've seen a direct attack on scientific institutions in Canada. Whether it's cuts in funding, the muzzling of scientists, the commercialization of research, or the systemic shift to policy making based on ideology, not evidence. These attacks will have a tremendous impact on our public institutions. We're losing out on expanding our understanding of how the world works in a basic way. As a result of these cuts and shift in priorities, the federal government is not only changing the way we do research in Canada, they are changing the way we learn. We are losing the fundamental curiosity-based exploration and inquiry. These are things that the private sector will not do, but they are the backbone on which commercializable research is built. Students are calling on the federal government to commit to science in the public interest by investing in science research from basic to applied, to make policy decisions based on scientific evidence, not ideology, and by supporting the communication of all publicly funded research. Thank you, merci. Last but not least for our speakers, Dr. John Stone is on his way up. We did this a year ago. It was a great success. But I sincerely hope we don't have to make this an annual event. Yes. <laughs> that we solve, that we can solve this nonsense problem that we have. At the end of this month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is going to release the first part of its grand assessment. And it's going to tell us in very simple, straightforward, clear terms that the climate is changing. And it's changing in dangerous ways. And it's changing because we have overloaded the atmosphere with our emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. Despite this, despite the urgency, we are not getting the action. We seem to be in denial of the evidence. And what is worse, we are hindering our scientists, some of our best scientists, from being able to share their science with us. It wasn't always so. There was a golden age of Canadian science when we built institutions like the National Research Council, the Fisheries Research Board, the Defence Research Establishment, the Geological Survey of Canada. These were world-leading institutions. And what is important is they were led by scientists who had in their own right an enormous international reputation. In those days, Ministers used to regularly consult with heads of those research institutions. There was a true dialogue. The scientists were listened to, the ministers were informed. Before I retired, I ran the Federal Climate Research Program. The government provided us with additional funds through something which was then called the Green Plan. And we were able to make significant contributions to science. We really, truly punched above our weight. And at that time, I had the privilege of serving on the Bureau of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And we could truly be proud of what Canada, Canadian science, and Canadian scientists were, were delivering. But in recent years, we've seen this terrible listening of assaults, of injustices done to Canadian science and to Canadian scientists. My colleagues abroad ask me what on earth is going on in this country and what has happened to our reputation. They're very polite, of course. <laughs> and as was mentioned, the leading international science magazine Nature has editorials on the muzzling of science in Canada. This is truly embarrassing. I believe there's a bargain. I believe that scientists have a responsibility to warn. But I equally believe that governments have a responsibility to listen 
to the evidence. No science, no evidence, no truth, no democracy. No science, no evidence, no truth, no democracy. Awesome. Many people, including many scientists, think that the real, real value of science lies in what we can do with the secrets that we wrest from nature. I don't think so. Its real value lies much, much deeper. What's our scarcest natural resource? Oil, potable water, timber, fish? No. Our scarcest natural resource is creativity and imagination. And creativity and imagination are born of curiosity. And the natural world is the natural focus for the inquiring mind. That's the real value of scientific research. To stimulate creativity and imagination and provide an outlet for it via the scientific method. Democracy is rooted in the twin principles of transparency and accountability. These principles demand that government decisions and their justification be made explicit. Justification means bringing forward evidence that the decision is likely to achieve desired goals or at least unlikely to lead to undesired consequences. While as Canadians we may disagree on what goals are desirable, informed opinion demands that the best available evidence, however unpalatable, be presented, carefully scrutinized, and publicly debated. Almost a, almost a century and a half ago, Thomas Huxley, who some of you may recognize as Darwin's bulldog, noted that there is nothing exalted about the scientific method. It is, in fact, merely the normal working of the human mind. So to all of those scientists out there who don't yet know it, embrace your inner scientist. <laughs> Be skeptical. Demand evidence, all the evidence in unfiltered form. And when it is provided, consider it carefully. So to all Canadian scientists and non-scientists alike, I would ask not only that you stand up for science, but that you keep standing up now and in the future. Thank you.